Welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I'm Joel and I'm here with Booktopian Stefania and Ross Coulthard to talk about his book In Plain Sight. Thanks for joining us, Ross. It's a real pleasure. Lovely to be here. It's a, it's such a um, weird pitch, this book. <laughs> when I Can I tell you, about it. One, one of the things in journalism, when I said as a serious insect journalist that I was doing a, a book about UFOs, <laughs> So many of my colleagues took me aside and said, "Are you sure? You know, is it? You know, basically, you know, is everything all right? You know, have you gone? Have you gone nuts?" And there's there's quite a prominent columnist in one of the newspapers who wrote that Ross Coulthard has um, become a tinfoil hat crazy and he's writing a book about aliens. Which, funnily enough, I'm not. What fascinated me about this whole subject is that taboo. There is this incredible taboo, this stigma that surrounds this whole subject that I think is, frankly, completely unjustified, Um, especially when you consider, as I discovered, because I I kind of went into this thinking, I'm going to be sceptical. I'm going to approach this with all the skill set that I've got as an investigative reporter and have a look at the, the one big taboo issue in journalism. And this is it. This really is it. It's one of the stories you just don't go near. Editors are always telling me when I was there on the Sydney Morning Herald or in the ABC, you don't do stories about UFOs. And I'd go, well, why not? It's, you know, people are seeing things. And ultimately, the, the view was it's all rubbish. It needs to be ridiculed. They're all crazy people. Ignore them. Then in April last year, and this was a turning point during my research, the Pentagon issued a press statement and they admitted in April last year that they couldn't explain three anomalous videos of anomalous objects that had been filmed by US fighter pilots on the west and east coast of America. And this was a huge paradigm shift, a huge turning point in America because the New York Times, one of the world's greatest newspapers in December 2017, ran these leaked videos from the US Navy taken by US fighter pilots on the West Coast from the USS Nimitz and uh, two more taken on the East Coast by pilots generally from the USS Theodore Roosevelt, both huge aircraft carriers. All of these aircraft carriers were part of battle cruiser fleets with massive numbers of ships with fantastic sensor systems, radars, at fleur forward looking infrared imaging. And there was no mistaking what they saw. And in 2004, which is when this all starts, these US fighter pilots from the USS Nimitz discovered this object that looked, when they saw it with their naked eyes, like a gigantic tic-tac peppermint. And it was the length of a, a small plane. It had no visible propulsion system. And it was flitting around the sky as they watched and they tracked it on their radar systems. In one particular movement that was tracked by the USS Princeton, which is one of the world's most advanced radar boats, the object went from 80,000 feet or above, possibly in orbit, to the surface of the ocean in 0.78 of a second. Now, that is incontrovertibly what happened. It was tracked on multiple sensor systems. That is hundreds of thousands of kilometers an hour. Anybody, any human being inside that object would have been turned to mash soup with that kind of momentum. But the objects were intelligently controlled because, as some of the fighter pilots have told me, as they sought to engage with the objects, the objects literally They went down in a dive, spiralling down with their aircraft, as aircraft have to do. And as they were spiralling down, the object on the ocean began spiralling up. And when they were at nine o'clock, it was at three o'clock. When they were at 12 o'clock, it was at six o'clock. And then finally, one of the pilots describes how when they got almost level, he decided to do a dive across the clock face. And he screamed, turned his jet and screamed towards this object. And as he watched, in an instant, the object just went and took off at thousands of kilometers an hour. 
This was the paradigm shift turning point because people have been seeing these things literally for decades, if not, I suspect, hundreds of years, thousands of years. This was the turning point because at that moment, the world's most advanced radar systems, an E-2 Hawkeye aircraft was also circling. It picked up the same object on its radar systems. They saw it with their naked eyes. It literally came up right beside the craft and they saw it. It was an intelligently controlled, metallic-looking craft. At that point, the US government had nothing it could do, because I think what's been happening is the US government's known about this phenomenon for at least 70 years. I'm very sure of it, because the documents that I've discovered in the archives of the American Defense Department, the CIA, the National Security Agency, they all show that contrary to what we've been told, oh, this is all rubbish, it all needs to be ridiculed, is this a taboo about this subject? Contrary to that notion, the reality is that it has been very much a focus of American military intelligence for many of those years. While they said that this was a subject that they, they could understand, that it was mainly swamp gas, weather balloons, misidentified aircraft, they were lying. They were, they were completely and utterly misleading the public. And, and I do think at the bottom of all of this, the American government knows a lot more than it's letting on. And the reason I know that is because senior people that I've now spoken to in the defense and intelligence departments of the American government, and indeed in our government in Australia, have admitted to me that they know a lot more about this phenomenon than the public knows. And so what happened as a result of those New York Times exposés about the sightings that took place in 2004 and then 2014, 2015, was political momentum happened in Congress. People like Marco Rubio, a Republican senator from Florida, pushed for some kind of inquiry and reluctantly, glacially, the military agreed. And so they set up a secret UAP task force, which investigated the phenomenon. And that task force reported to Congress in late June. And in late June, the report that was publicly released, which was a redacted version of the full report, acknowledged for the first time that the United States couldn't explain the vast majority of 144 sightings by its own pilots uh, is since, 19, since 2004. And it turns out, as I discovered when I was in the States in May and June, the United States is still experiencing these weird phenomena. There are craft all the time. And the word craft is being used by their own pilots. I've spoken to pilots who've flown in fighter jets from the east coast of the USA, from Virginia, and they've described seeing a translucent square object coming towards them with a charcoal sphere inside it, accelerating towards them at high speed, and then zooming between two aircraft, almost teasing them. And these sightings have been occurring in some cases on a weekly basis. And so these sightings have been occurring on a, on a regular basis. And the United States government fundamentally has now admitted that this phenomenon is real. So bugger the taboo. I don't care anymore. <laughs> the Pentagon says it's real. And this is what's different. We're now in a situation, we're in a completely new paradigm where despite all the ridicule, despite all the taboo that's been attached to the subject, the stigma, it turns out the Americans privately admit it's real, it's anomalous, it's doing maneuvers and speeds far beyond known human technology. And uh, they claim, I don't know if I can believe them, but they claim it's not theirs. They're not testing some new aircraft or, or aerospace vehicle in the black that, at Area 51. They're not trying to hide something. They've formally said, this is not ours. And more importantly, the report that came down to Congress in June, it also admitted that they don't think it's Russian or Chinese. 
They doubt very much that their rivals have achieved this level of technology because whoever it is, it's intelligently controlled. It's doing speeds and maneuvers far beyond known contemporary human technology. And it's, it's, it's not American, Russian, or Chinese. And that's the big shift. That's why, yes, there is a stigma attached to this whole subject, but people have got to get over that because even the US has admitted it's real. And what's happening, I, I feel a certain impatience as a journalist because I'm now getting phone calls from journos all over the world who are saying to me, hey, my, my government said to me that I should take this seriously, that this is real. And I'm going, yeah, you should. And journos, historically, we've all been attuned to the notion that this is all rubbish. We've all been told this is all taboo. I've been on the desk of a major national newspaper when somebody's rung up with a UFO sighting, and I've watched an editor just throw it in the bin. You know, people don't take this stuff seriously. And um, the uh, reality is that, frankly, um, it's real. Yeah, I mean, I must say, I experienced that, I think, reading it that this, uh, I constantly struggled to believe, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a really difficult, I think, um, leap to make when you've spent your entire life reading, um, you know, scathing put-downs of this type of sighting um, by sceptics. It's really hard to shift that, that mental paradigm when like you say, the US government has released reports saying they don't know what this is. And, Can I tell you and, one the, and, that, and that something has actually happened. And one thing that's fascinating to me about this is when I started going through the CIA's archives, the CIA has a library online that you can search. And they've declassified documents that Bill Clinton, the president, forced them to declassify. They didn't really want to do this. But what those documents show is that back in the 1960s, the CIA deliberately set out to ridicule and stigmatize the subject of UFOs. Mm -hmm. They decided the best way to shut down, they wanted to shut it down. And so they decided as a deliberate policy, they would go to Hollywood and they'd get movies out there that ridiculed the subject. And they would basically discourage journalists from running stories by telling them that it's all nonsense. Meanwhile, yeah. in the black, in secret, they were investigating this stuff. And this is, this is the moment that I came to as a journo because I, I thought to myself, I'm going to find eventually that this is poppycock and I'm going to find a reason to disbelieve this. The more I engaged with it, the more, I mean, I was shocked some of the people who agreed to speak to me, many of them on a background only basis, but these were senior officials people who'd been at a very high level in the Defence Department of the United States, Britain, uh, the intelligence services of those countries. These are people who, and indeed, some people have actually commented publicly, like a former two former CIA directors, former directors of the Central Intelligence Agency. They've actually spoken publicly and acknowledged that this is a phenomenon that needs to be taken seriously. And I actually think it goes further than this. Uh, I know this sounds like a wacky conspiracy theory, but there were indubitably, and we know this because of the WikiLeaks leaks that you would read about in the book, in um, 2017 or so, WikiLeaks dumped an enormous pile of emails from the Democratic National Congress, the DNC, the Democratic Party. And they were largely emails in, involving Hillary Clinton's bid for the presidency. And it was actually an attempt by the Russian intelligence services to destabilize Hillary's bid for the presidency. They were trying to prop up Trump. <laughs> Little did they know it actually, uh, he, he won anyway. But what's interesting is that in those emails, the emails show that a punk rocker by the name of Tom DeLong from Blink-182, the rock band, who was a complete UFO obsessive, He'd been talking for years about how he was in touch with Pentagon generals who were secretly briefing him about the US government's secret UFO program, that they'd recovered extraterrestrial spacecraft, that they'd actually um, started trying to re-engineer 
these craft. Now, I can't speak to the veracity of the claims that are made in the emails that were, that were stolen from the DNC, but indubitably, the emails show that John Podesta, the former chief of staff to Barack Obama, a former senior advisor to President Clinton, and the campaign manager for Hillary Clinton, he was engaging with Tom DeLong from Blink-182, the rock band, and two very senior past Pentagon generals. One was uh, General Michael Carey, and another was General Neil McCasland. And what those emails all showed was that inside a very closed Google Hangout confidential meeting group, they were planning for Hillary Clinton to make a disclosure of some kind. And it was clearly a disclosure about what the US government knows about what we now politely call, by the way, UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, not UFOs. It's too loaded. Everybody thinks of little green men when you talk about UFOs. But essentially, it's clear from those emails, the WikiLeaks emails, that the Pentagon knows a hell of a lot more than it's let on publicly. And there were two generals who were liaising with Hillary Clinton's campaign manager in the event that she became president they were planning to make a disclosure of some kind. And there's even a, an email where General Neil McCasland is discuss, discussing how that disclosure would be made and through what offices it should be communicated. And they're talking about NASA. They're talking about, um, I think, some National Oceanographic Institute. There's a whole lot of things that they're discussing that they're putting in place, clearly planning for the eventuality of a Hillary Clinton presidency. And I think what happened was when Donald Trump, that buffoon, won the presidency in 2016, everything changed. It was all put on ice. But now, now that Trump's out of power and the Democrats are back in power, you've got Joe Biden, a fairly safer pair of hands than Trump. People who were involved in that disclosure process prior to 2016 are now back in the game. And so what you're now seeing is you're seeing, seeing maneuvering in the Congress on both the Republican side and the Democrat side, where they're talking about public hearings, congressional hearings, where military witnesses will be called to give evidence about what they know. And look, I've spoken to some of those military witnesses, and I don't know 100% whether or not to believe them, but people have gone on the record, not only with me, They've got on the record with the New York Times, the world's greatest newspaper, and they have made the allegation that the United States government has retrieved non-human technology, which is mind-blowing. It is mind-blowing. <laughs> it is mind-blowing. And, and I've had conversations with people in very senior circles in defence and intelligence in the US and also in Australia who have told me that they think it's true that the United States government is in possession not only of exotic technology, which is the word they're using, but also possibly of craft, and that they've been lying to the public for the last 70 years about events like Roswell and events like Aztec and other alleged crashes of craft that occurred in the 1940s and the 1950s. Now, I'm not saying it's little green men. But what I am saying is the, and because as a journalist, I can only believe in what I see happening. And what I see happening is there is certainly a dialogue occurring at a very high level in the US where people are admitting that they know a lot more than they're letting on. And there are certainly things happening where the US is admitting that it has been researching technology in the black secret programs, which involve things like advanced propulsion systems, like anti-gravitics. Now, that's the holy grail of propulsion. If you can make something lighter than, lighter than air and not have to use heavy-duty um, chemical energy to lift it off the ground, then that's a wonderful achievement. I still think, frankly, until I see something and can kick the tires of it, I won't believe it. But um, uh, there are people who claim that the US is working on this technology in the black. 
Now, for years, we've all been taught to giggle and to titter slightly when this subject's raised. Oh, you know, they're all tinfoil hat crazy. They're all alien believers. The more I dug, the more I realized this is a deliberate disinformation process. Somebody is putting out spin. Mm. Because when I spoke to defense people and intelligent people, one of the people I've interviewed, and he went on the record for my book, was the former director of science and technology development for the entire US Navy, a guy called Nat Kobitz. Nat's now dead, sadly. He was dying of cancer, which is why he was quite happy to talk to me. Because as he said, what are they going to do to me? Um, Nat told me that he was briefed, briefed, read into a classified crash retrieval program. And when I said, what do you mean crash retrieval? You're talking about Russians? You're talking about Chinese jets or something? He went, no, 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 I'm talking about alien spacecraft. And this is from a guy who was the chief geek for the US Navy. Now, I'm not the only one saying this. The New York Times, no less, has said this. It did a story last year, in July last year, where it ran sources directly quoted asserting that the US is working on technology that is not of this world. So I do think we have to prepare ourselves for the possibility that the US is on the brink of preparing the public for some kind of disclosure and that the ridicule and taboo that has been attached to this subject for so many years, it's going to turn out was wholly unjustified. Mm. Do you think, you know, that there is any other explanation for it? I know the US government's explanations for it are like very, very bad. Yeah. <laughs> the, the explanations that they, the official explanations they give. And uh, reading the book, I, I can't help but put that down to sort of a form of um, soft power almost, that, the, the, but that by indicating that it might be real and also denying it, that there is some sort of benefit that accrues to the US government in the same way that, you know, uh, psychological ops campaigns where they, you know, if, if people in the US and around the world believe that the US might have this technology, there's a benefit that accrues to the US. If they think the US is capable of concealing a conspiracy this big, that benefits the US. Sure. There is, but there is but two what possibilities. is the reasonable explanation if not, if okay. not aliens? <laughs> there's, two, there's two possibilities. Well, actually, there's three. The first possibility that I still think is highly plausible is that someone in private aerospace, not a government, not a sovereign state, is secretly working on this technology. And there is some evidence to support that possibility that maybe a Lockheed Martin or a TRW or somebody out there, one of the big aerospace giants, is secretly working on technology that it's preparing in the black. I find it wholly implausible, though, that the United States wouldn't know about that because they would. They'd be the one that would be funding it. That's the way it works. Um, there is also the possibility that the United States is lying, which it's done before. You know, it's lied about the development of new technology in the past because you have to keep this stuff secret. That's always a possibility that they are secretly working on some kind of new aerospace technology. Because what, whatever we say about this, we're now in a situation where indubitably there is intelligently controlled advanced technology zooming around our skies in our orbit, because they're tracking it in orbit as well, and in our ocean. It's also being tracked in the ocean. They've tracked objects underwater traveling at hundreds of knots, far faster than any known torpedo or submarine. So there is a possibility that this is something that's being developed in the black, maybe in collusion between private aerospace and the US government. The only other possibility is that it's one of the rivals, China, Russia, but I'm pretty sure it's not. And then if you exclude all those possibilities, all we are left with is that some other intelligence is flying stuff in our air, in our it's, sea. It's astounding. <laughs> I know. And, I, and, and the thing that blows me away is I, I worked through this the other day with a journo from a very eminent 
British newspaper who rang me, who knows me, and said, look, Ross, I, I've seen the promotion for your book, and I've spoken to various people who told me I should speak to you. And he says, I'm hearing similar stuff from our Defence Department. And I said, yeah, you, you should be. You will be. There is a paradigm shift occurring. I hate that word, but there is. There's a huge mm. shift occurring where during the Cold War, I think there was, I, I think in all likelihood, there is definitely, I, I should, it's not even a likelihood, I'm absolutely certain this technology exists. I just don't know who's driving it. That's the interesting thing. And good people like Christopher Mellon, a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defence, somebody who was very, very high up in the US Defence Department, he told me in interview that he didn't think it was US technology. And he had the keys to all the secrets. He worked as a, a very senior staffer on the Senate Intelligence Committee. And he worked for a, a senator called Robert Byrd. And back in the 80s, when I first did a UFO story, I did a story about the weird triangular craft that were being seen all over Europe at that stage in the 80s. Somebody, something, someone was flying triangular craft over Belgium, Germany, and the UK. And a lot of people, tens of thousands of people saw them. And there was speculation in the press in the UK that it was some new aircraft, some new aerospace technology called the Aurora, which was allegedly an anti-gravitically propelled craft. And uh, Chris Mellon told me that he was assigned as a staffer on the Senate Intelligence Committee to go and literally walk into Area 51, the secret the secret testing place where the US military tests all this stuff, go and have a look, look in the cupboard. And he tells me he did, and he didn't find that kind of technology. Now, it's always possible, and he would no doubt concede this possibility, it's always possible that he's been lied to, that there is a decision that was made by executive order of a president maybe tens of years ago which basically said that you will keep this secret as long as possible, like the Manhattan Project. That's always possible. But once you've excluded all of those possibilities, if it's not Russian, if it's not private aerospace, if it's not Chinese, and if it's not American, well, confrontingly, that only leaves one other possibility. Mm. It's not human. Yeah. And, you know, some of the other tidbits in the book that you cover, like in the Tic Tac incident um, about the, you know, the, the the craft sort of meeting the fighter pilot back at the rendezvous point. I might be getting the terminology. No, no, not at all. No. Indicates that there's, that there's, it's, it's not just some sort of, uh, I don't know, remote control. I, I, it feels like there's, there's a lot more intelligence at work there that has well, a lot one, of access. One of the things... One of the things I've got into in the course of this research is really wacky stuff, like quite confronting stuff, but from people in defence, people who've told me that they've worked on programs where they've investigated this phenomenon and they think that whatever it is, it has the capacity to manipulate human perception. And they're talking, when they talk to me privately, they talk openly about this being a non-human intelligence. I kid you not. There are people working at a very high level in the United States Defense Department who candidly speak to somebody like me about the likelihood that what we are engaging with here is a non-human intelligence. And there are documents that have been leaked from a secret UFO investigation task force that was set up, funded by the Defense Intelligence Agency. It's notoriously called Slide 9. And essentially, it was a slide used in a briefing for the Under Secretary of Defense. And in that slide, it told the Under Secretary of Defense that a technology exists which has the capacity to manipulate human perception and consciousness. And ultimately, whenever you talk to these people, I've talked to some incredibly kick ass scientists in the course of this research. It all comes down to consciousness that they're not entirely sure what they're engaging with. And that's why they're uncomfortable with the word extraterrestrial. But people like Lou Elizondo, who was the former head, he's a former senior counterintelligence officer. 
He um, worked with our special forces in Kandahar as a younger man, and then he went on to become a very senior counterintelligence officer working for the Office of the um, Director of National Intelligence in the Defence Department of the United States. And he has quite openly talked about the possibility that we have to consider the possibility that this isn't extraterrestrial. He has actually canvassed the possibility that this is intra terrestrial, that we are sharing this planet with something that is non-human, but which is intelligent. Now, I know that sounds off the wall. I, really <laughs> I mean, think. at this point. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that sounds off the wall, but I have had some pretty wacky conversations with some incredibly senior scientists and defense officials in the course of this research. And they're not talking about if, they're talking about when the public are going to be told this. They're talking about how there is a decision-making process happening right now in the Congress, in the White House, and in very high-level three-letter agencies in the US government, and in collaboration with the allies like Australia, the Five Eyes Alliance, where they're discussing how to tell the public what they know. Now, I think there is still a possibility that we are at a nascent stage in our understanding of this phenomenon. But what I think we might see is an admission by the US government that there is something intelligent with highly advanced technology operating in our aerospace. They've already made that admission. That's already on the record. But I think they might make the leap that eventually in the next two to five years, they will make the connection that it's not human. And that is going to be an epochal moment in human history. And I, I, I don't know. One other, there is one other possibility. There is one other possibility. The other possibility is that as part of some convoluted effort to try and scare China and Russia, the Americans are trying to convince the rest of the world that they have technology that they don't yet have. And so this is all an elaborate hoax that all of the things that they've seen on radars were constructed and, and fabricated. And that this is an elaborate disinformation campaign to make the Russians and the Chinese just that little bit more nervous about engaging with the US as a military power. And now that's an elaborate conspiracy theory, but it's one that's been put to me by a guy from Israel who, who said to me, look, we, we still have to consider the possibility that, that you know, this is um, a big lie. But mm. the problem I have with that is I've spoken to pilots and their government doesn't know that I've spoken to them. I'm very, very sure of that. I've spoken to pilots who have seen this phenomenon with their own eyes. And they're terrified of being identified because they're operating under secrecy orders. They're operating under constraints on what they can say. Because at the moment, there's a huge battle going on inside the Pentagon where the US Air Force is obstructing other agencies that want this story to be told. And there are good people believe it or not, in the Pentagon, who actually feel that it's time that the public be told what the US knows. But I, I suspect that there are some in the Air Force, if, if hypothetically, if they have recovered technology and it's super advanced technology, and if they're trying to re-engineer it, I do think it's possible that they're trying to hang on to that secret for as long as possible and not be forced to reveal it. So I think we might see some kind of qualified admission by the US government in the next year or so that, yes, whatever this is, we don't think it's Russian, we don't think it's Chinese, we don't think it's American, and we think it's possibly alien. Yeah. I think, I think you might get to see that admission. Because that's what I mean, people it would are telling be amazing me. if it happened. I, I know, <laughs> and, and, I, and that's what people are telling me privately. And, and the interesting thing is it puts a lot of historical incidents that have occurred all around the world for decades, right since World War II, especially since World War II, especially since we started tinkering with nuclear weapons. There's been an incredible leap in the number of sightings of these weird objects, especially over Australia. I mean, Australia, uh, during the um, 
the nuclear tests and the weapons testing that was done by the British in the 1940s and the 1950s, when the Brits were testing their bombs in the, in the Australian outback, I was amazed because in the Australian files, there are just voluminous numbers of sightings reports where you can see that the public wasn't really getting the whole story. At the same time that we were being told, oh, it's all rubbish, you know, it's all balderdash, you know, don't take it seriously, you know, you're, you're seeing things, you know, take it from us. Behind the scenes, they were monitoring this technology, they were monitoring this phenomenon, and they were talking about them as craft, as vehicles, intelligently controlled vehicles that were buzzing weapons sites that in the middle of nuclear tests, they'd see craft, elliptical disc-shaped craft hovering over the Maralinga nuclear test site. Incredible stuff that was recorded by senior military personnel directed up the chain to senior people in the Air Force. Mm. And what, Do you think there's an explanation for why, yeah. if that's true, um, and there are other nuclear powers in the world who have, you know, who have also been tinkering with nuclear power and nuclear you would assume the same thing is happening around the world. It is. And that and that other governments who are perhaps not on the same page as the United States would have also recovered. Every nuclear power is having this experience. I, I've, I've right. talked recently to people in Russia, uh, a guy called Timofey Urganov, who is the head of cosmonaut training at the Star Cosmonaut Training Facility in the US, in the, in the Russian Republic. And he has introduced me to um, various uh, generals, commanders in the Soviet, in the Russian military, who told me the long history of Russian sightings. And alarmingly, <laughs> I mean, in the US, there's a lovely man I interviewed called Bob Salas, who was a nuclear launch commander. He sat literally inside a missile silo and prepared to push the button if the president gave the order in the event of nuclear war. And he described to me in alarming detail how one day an object, a craft hovering over his ICBM missile silo, literally shut down all 10 of his Minuteman missiles. So he was not able, if he'd been asked, thank God, to launch his missiles. And he thinks now he was being sent a message. He thinks that the US military knows full well that this technology doesn't like, what well, this intelligence doesn't like our nuclear technology. And so when I spoke to the Russians the other day, I spoke to a former um, very senior person in the Russian military, and they told me, yes, we've had exactly the same incidents happen over our nuclear facilities. But in at least one case, it switched our missile on it actually armed our missile ready for launch. And he says that was terrifying because it showed us that it was able to circumvent all of the backstops that we've got to stop that from happening. And he says it was inexplicable. He said it wasn't meant to happen. Only President Putin can give the order for a launch. The same thing has happened in the UK. Uh, I've interviewed people who've witnessed um, uh, strange anomalous objects, craft, UAPs, whatever you want to call them, flying saucers, UFOs, hovering over British nuclear facilities that the Americans had based on British soil. The same things happened in France. Same things happened in India. Same things happened in Israel. Everywhere where there's nuclear power, including nuclear energy, these objects have been sighted. And it's speculation, but yeah, I mean, some of the people involved have told me that they think that they're being sent a message, that, that whatever this intelligence is, it doesn't like us using nuclear weapons, doesn't like us splitting atoms. Now, I don't know. I'm not in possession of all of the answers. But what I can do as a journalist is I can see a bloody good mystery when I see one. And it's a <laughs> rollicking. I mean, I, I cannot believe that we have allowed ourselves, now that I know what I know, I cannot believe that we in the mainstream media have allowed ourselves to be manipulated so successfully for so many years, because it's like there is this gigantic bear in the room. You know, all these years we've been taught, and it, and it is, it's a default. Everybody, you know, I'll sit at a dinner party and somebody says, oh, what's your latest book about, Ross? And, and I'll say, oh, it's about UFOs. And there's immediately a kind of a giggle or a smile, an ironic <laughs> smile that it goes across people's faces. Why do we do that? 
Why do we do that? It's because we've been acculturated into that. We've been taught it's all nonsense. But as I'm learning from Pentagon generals and defense intelligence officials and spooks, it's real. And that's the difference. And it puts now sightings like the Australian Westall incident in April of 1966, when 200 kids and adults looked up and saw three elliptical metallic discs hovering over a suburban Melbourne school. It puts a new context in why, why did we ignore that sighting at the time when there was such an obvious cover-up? There was a massive cover-up. And the thing that fascinated me when I went and knocked on the door of Andrew Greenwood, the science teacher, who 55 years ago, after he'd seen these craft hovering over the school ground with hundreds of other kids, 55 years ago, he's sitting in his house as a young 20-something school teacher, and there's a knock on the door. And on the doorstep is a very senior Australian Air Force official dressed in uniform with the rings on his arm or whatever. And the other person is clearly somebody from the police or intelligence services. And they basically say to him, you will shut up about what you saw. And if you don't, you, we will make sure that you lose your job as a school teacher. And they said, we will slur you with the defamatory and untrue allegation that you are drinking on the job, that you're an alcoholic. And he's angry to this day, 55 years on, that he wasn't taken seriously at the time when he spoke to the local media. So are all of the witnesses that I've spoken to from that incident. They feel completely ridiculed and disenfranchised. And a large part of the reason why they haven't spoken about it is because a lot of them feel angry that for so many years, any time they were engaged with by the media or by the general public interested in this issue, they were ridiculed, they were stigmatized and laughed at, when in fact what they wanted was to be taken seriously. And, and the, the interesting thing is, yes, there are crazy people that make allegations about UFOs. Believe me, I've spoken to some of them. But there are crazy people that make allegations about a whole lot of things, but we don't stop ignoring a subject just because of a few crazy people. And what's happened with UFOs, what's happened with the phenomenon of unidentified aerial phenomena is, frankly, we've allowed ourselves to be disinformed. And mm -hmm. I, now that the Pentagon has admitted and other governments in the world are beginning to admit that this is a real phenomenon, for example, the the, the, the times are changing. I mean, I was, I was just jumping around because um, Japan just recently, one of the uh, big newspapers in Japan just yesterday ran a story talking about how the Japanese government is now openly working with the US government to record unidentified aerial phenomena because their pilots are seeing this stuff as well. It's not, a, it's not, a lot of people say to me, oh, why do the, only the Americans see this stuff? You know, how come it's only ever Americans that get buzzed? And the reality is it's not true. I've spoken mm. to fighter pilots and um, commercial pilots here in Australia who've told me that they've often seen anomalous objects, but it's not good for their career. The perception is that it's really bad for their career to talk about this. Uh, and now there's an opening. The United States Air Force has now issued a direction to all of its pilots that they must report unidentified aerial phenomena. And the reason why is because the report to Congress admitted two things. It, it admitted that these objects, whatever they are, are real and that they are a direct threat to flight safety. And it, it also admitted that um, they were a possible threat to national security. And so that's really ramped it up in America. It's now a congressional issue and there are now discussions going on uh, in various senatorial and congressional offices discussing when and if there will be congressional hearings to have the public hear what the military knows. And I think at those hearings, there will be admissions made that are quite momentous because I've spoken to some of the people that are going to be giving evidence. And I think the public is being prepared for revelations that are massive. And there's going to be a huge... Russ, I... I, I I wish I could keep talking to you about this because uh, honestly, it's so fascinating. I would like to invite you to a dinner party where I get to pick your brains all night. Anytime. It's Anytime. so fascinating. Yeah. I'll bring the red um, wine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just so amazing. I feel like it, it deserves the extra time because it is strange and who knows, but 
the, the the fact of the matter is you say as you say there's there's a shift going on here something is happening um so i i, th I urge everyone who's listening to have a read of the book it's really fascinating and even if you don't believe it you'll really enjoy it <laughs> <laughs> and uh it, it's a it's a great read ross thank you so much for joining us it's a real uh, pleasure, pleasure. Joel, a real pleasure <laughs> stefania as well lovely to talk to both thank of you, you. Thank you. Uh, and you can you can buy In Plain Sight from booktopia.com.au or from your local bookshop. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces, and more. Or, if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast, and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia, Australia's local bookstore, at booktopia.com.au.